captive crowd. And I think from looking at your slides, uh, Luke and Paola, I think you'll be fine. So let's give it just another two minutes. Sounds good. Can you give us a few minutes and we can get started for this meeting for a couple more people to get on? Yeah, when you can turn up the volume on this, this is very hard to hear. Him. All right, we have about 30 people on, so that's, I think, a good a good crowd. So welcome to the Roy Benke Department of Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, here we are another Thursday with another outstanding talk. And this one is one that is extremely special to many of us, and it's our annual patient safety and quality improvement lecture, which is given by our patient safety chief residents. So very proud this week. We had a external site visit, which is standard for departments of internal medicine. And it was a honor to speak to these three chairs of medicine who came as part of the visit from Ohio State, MUSC, and LSU uh, to talk to them about our Patient Safety Quality Improvement Fellowship, which was one of the first founded in the nation, VA or non-VA, by the godfather of patient safety and quality improvement himself, Alexander Rice, Dr. Rice. Dr. Rice himself is celebrating 20 years at USF. So this lecture is also uh, very special given the background of Dr. Rice's anniversary in the VA. And Dr. Rice has uh, helped sh uh, to shepherd in uh, about 12 years of patient safety quality improvement fellows, including Dr. Elizabeth Melzer, uh, who is on today, and who it runs the program directly, and Dr. Phil Rattucci, who is part of our staff at the VA, as well as Dr. Nidhi Patel, who is out now also um, part of our staff at the VA and was previously at Tampa General and the VA, but still we're all part of the USF Department of Internal Medicine. And of course, Jamie Weber, who plays a vital role in patient safety, quality improvement in GME. So Jamie Weber, Elizabeth Mauser, Phil Rattucci, Nidhi Patel, all graduates of the Patient Safety Quality Improvement Program, including also Dr. Henry Park, uh, who is our first ever graduate of Patient Safety Quality Improvement. And he plays a key role in simulation for the USF Department of Internal Medicine here at the VA. The, what the program has accomplished to include its recognition by the Institute for Safe Medication Practices, uh, is beyond the scope of what we would be able to do in an introduction. But needless to say, the University of South Florida's Patient Safety Quality Improvement Fellowship is considered one of the finest, if not the finest in the nation, visited by multiple bodies uh, every year, every other year. Uh, it's always it was always nice to see the Ivy Leagues coming here to see us, uh, besides other universities from the Southeast. And kudos to Dr. Rice, Dr. Melzer, for all that they do in the leadership of this program. And congratulations on everything that Dr. Weber, Dr. Nidhi Patel, and Dr. Ritucci are accomplishing for our department here. If I forgot any of the other graduates there, oh, I am forgetting one, Roger Nihal, and two, uh, Elizabeth uh, Rhythm is a Dantzler Peak. Uh, how could I forget those two other great graduates? This is what happens when I do an introduction from rote memory. Um, but I'm doing okay, I think. Uh, Roger and Elizabeth also are, are just outstanding graduates. So as you can see, this, this program has a very special place in my heart, and it is a distinguishing feature as recognized by three other chairs of internal medicine in the country this week for our university. 
With that said, the latest two entrants into our outstanding superstars are going to, are going to be faculty members here at USF. So um, this is a big reveal for everybody that um, Dr. Uh, Joseph Luconio and Dr. Paola Algarin Troya will be joining the staff of the James Haley Veterans Hospital and will be joining our Department of Internal Medicine. We are so excited about that. Dr. Algarin Troya uh, graduated from Michigan State University and then Central Michigan uh, University College of Medicine. So after she got her Michigan out of the way, she came and continued the green tradition, uh, switched her colors to a, a um, I think a similar dark green to uh, us USF Bulls. Paola has been an outstanding uh, a member of our residency here and now as our chief residence and continues in a legacy tradition as her uncle Felix Rivera trained here at USF, uh, graduated in 98 from Re internal medicine residency in 2001 from GI. Dr. Joseph Luke O'Neill, who I felt I've known forever, because uh, he I met him when he was a first year medical student here at USF. Before arriving at USF, he uh, ran the circles of College of Charleston and Rutgers uh, before making his way uh, to the Mecca that is USF. And through his medical school days and his residency and his chief residency, he also has been an outstanding superstar. One of the joys is watching the patient safety residents work so well together. I also want to give recognition to Kevin Parza, who is the ambulatory care patient safety chief resident here at the VA and has done outstanding work, and Yasin Naga, our administrative fourth year chief resident. With the world's longest possible introduction over, <laughs> I now turn it over to Paola and Luke to give us a quality in healthcare measuring what matters update. Thank you. Well, thank you for the kind words, Dr. Lazama. We appreciate it. Um, like Dr. Lazama mentioned, I'm Dr. Paola Algarin Troya. Um, I'm one of the inpatient chief residents in quality improvement and patient safety, and we are very excited to give you guys this talk today. Thank you for the very kind introduction. I'm Luke O'Neill, the other inpatient chief resident for quality and patient safety at the James A. Haley VA. So here's here are what we're going to be covering today. Uh, quality in healthcare, some of the different organizations that judge quality, the different ways in which they do that with measures and metrics, and then um, turning that towards quality improvement. So no talk on quality in healthcare would be complete without an obligatory reference to the to Errors Human Report in 1999 and the follow-up uh, crossing the quality chasm. The, po the point of this slide is to tell us what is what quality, what are we talking about in terms of definitions? There are multiple different domains, but in general, care that is safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable. And so the history of not only medicine, but quality improvement and quality measurement in medicine is a long one. Um, the American College of Surgeons were the first group to actually uh, accredit or visit on-site hospitals to, to give deeper analysis as to the level of performance at a facility. Um, JCO, which is now the Joint Commission after their rebranding, uh, was formed in 1951 to the to the same effect and and then later in this century uh that cms has begun their value-based purchasing programs but uh, those two reports that we mentioned earlier really sort of turn the page in terms of the focus of quality in healthcare and the level of detail and data and measurement and measures changing dramatically uh around the turn of the century and so OK, if we've gone over what constitutes quality, all of those different domains, what what constitutes healthcare? And at the beginning of this timeline, what made medicine was or the way in which medical care was delivered was very different um, at the origination of of some of these institutions compared to what medic what medical care looks like today and the um, the degree of complexity and all of the opportunities for different things to, to go wrong um, have expanded exponentially. So I'm going to give a review of some of the many organizations which measure, uh, judge, evaluate different aspects of the domains that comprise quality in healthcare. Um, these will be names that many of you will be familiar with, namely the Joint Commission, which is responsible for Oryx, 
um, which was instituted in 1999 and, and attached to payment later uh, in penalties in 2012, which aims to integrate the performance measures of an institution into the patient outcomes, um, uh, which are voluntary accreditation across 21,000 different organizations in the United States. There's a public facing website where you can uh, see the results of the institution of your choices latest site visit from the Joint Commission, and it highlights the national patient safety goals and the institution's performance on those. CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, um, really the origin back in 1977, they're responsible for uh, a lot of different measures, some of which include the Hospital Inpatient Quality Reporting Program, um, which purports to be able to assess the, the quality and costs of care for the Medicare population as well as uh, being responsible for, for HCAPs, the Hospital Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems, uh, which is a survey of the patient's experiences across the 4,000 or so hospitals that are Medicare accredited. The LeapFrog Group is more a patient safety oriented nonprofit group that conducts a voluntary hospital survey that assesses um, threats to patient safety in uh, about 2,000 different hospitals across the United States, across 30 different performance measures. That, that they evaluate for and they they roll that up into a composite grade for the facility. And um, so patients and the general public have some sense of comparison, which we'll go through. And then the core quality measures collaborative, which was uh, it's a 70 or so different organization, public private partnership, mainly between CMS and America's health insurance providers, among other stakeholders to try and develop a common language, a core set of measures that can be used for apples to apples comparisons across different facilities and health systems, while also decreasing the reporting burden and decreasing duplicative efforts for making measures or, or metrics around clinical questions of, of interest and performance improvement questions. Um, and as well as uh, that instead of adding more measures, to rather pick the best ones and then through an evolutionary profit process to try to improve them and add the necessary components to be able to tell the facilities how their performance on this number means that they are or are not delivering quality care for their patients. And so this, if you were to go to quality check and look up the James A. Haley VA, you could see the results of the most recent site visit, which, which went quite well. And the performance of the facility on a variety of different things, including things like uh, did you use two patient identifiers, um, process measures around safely using and administering medications, things like reducing hospital acquired infections through through hand uh, washing rates. But the the takeaway is well, many of the facilities that you look at for this report will get a check mark, meaning they're on target. And so if everywhere that you look up is generally going to get a check mark, unless they are extremely high performers, they get a plus sign. Uh, if you're below the target, you get a minus sign. If you're among the best in the nation, you get a gold star. Um, and if you don't report it, it's, it's not displayed. So this doesn't provide a particularly good discrimination value between facilities if everyone is generally performing at, at a similar level. For CMS, they have hospital compare, uh, which you're able to drill down a little bit into more detail uh, between up to five different facilities on individual clinical questions of, of interest. So this is kind of like if you're going shopping for a truck and you want to pick out, do I want a Ford, a Chevy, or a Dodge? You can select the different manufacturers and say, all right, how much horsepower does this one have? How much torque does this one have? How many pounds of towing can this one do? Uh, a variety of different, more specific measures, and then see where they stack up against each other. And I've selected this one because you can see for a three hour sepsis bundle, which is a clinical question of interest to of physicians and patients, the Tampa General outperforms not only Massachusetts General, the Johns Hopkins Hospital, and UCSF. Um, similarly, for C. difficile, uh, that Tampa General outperforms uh, the aforementioned facilities. Uh, and with one being parity to the national average is uh, overperforming. The LeapFrog group, which I mentioned before, has 30 different measures that are typically more oriented towards patient safety, um, and they provide this information in a snapshot across these different domains where you can at a glance get a sense of, all right, red, yellow, green, 
uh, how, how is this facility performing? And then if you select an individual measure that you can drill down, okay, what was their score for this hospital? And uh, what did the best hospitals look like? What did the worst hospitals look like? And what's the average? So you have a little bit more context with which to say, okay, what does this number mean to me or not? And then when they, they roll up all of these 30 different measures, then they produce a grade. And you can see the evolution of the performance of the facility as a whole over time. The Commonwealth Fund does not administer any of the measures that we've talked about so far, but they do produce a report where they try to pick and choose among the myriad different alphabet soup of agencies and measures and metrics. Which ones do they think represent how the healthcare system at the state level is performing overall in delivering health to the population that they are responsible for? And so like we talked about the six different domains of quality they break down and pick and choose a uh, selection of measures including how many people are insured or not interestingly did did adults go to a, a dentist that year um, the amount of spending that they receive and then things that are more oriented towards hospital medicine like 30-day mortality rates from cms uh, clab c infection rates as well as the ubiquitous hcaps survey for the patient's experience of their care uh, in addition to more aim uh, admissions for ambulatory care sensitive conditions such as community acquired pneumonia and then 30 day hospital readmission rates. And then uh, of a total of 56 different measures that they pick from a variety of sources that they stack up as a state. How did you perform on those 56 different measures? And then they line everyone up. And as you can see, the, the average, the magnitude of the bar is your, your score, green is good, red is bad. And then the states are listed in order unsurprisingly florida and some of the other states who have not expanded uh, medicaid will have large numbers of patients who are not uh, insured and so that factors heavily into this calculation while that doesn't necessarily speak to does the quality of care provided within the four walls of a hospital um it, it does speak to the how the population as a whole for the entire state or the healthcare system as a whole is, is performing in that sense and so instead of having to pick and choose uh, from among a litany of options that the CQMC's goal is to say, well, let's pick and choose the best and then uh, disregard the other ones and continue to, in an iterative process, add or modify or improve a few of the ones that are working and broadly uh, used and, and go from there such that we can decrease the reporting burden, um, uh, increase the amount of electronically um, delivered measures uh, that do not require a lot of administrative burden to report publicly. And so this is a, a snapshot of some of the core measures uh, that they have for the Medicaid population. Among them, things of clinical questions of clinical interest like routine cancer screening. Did did patients get appropriate colorectal cancer screenings? Um, a little bit more controversially in um, OBGYN is contraceptive care for reproductive women of you know 21 to 44. Are they on uh, highly or moderately effective birth control medications, including long acting um, reversible contraceptives? which which is a patient choice as opposed to that so the outcome of did they get the prescription are they taking it rather than did you counsel and appropriately um, discuss the options with the patient and they've elected a, a choice that is either yes or no ambulatory care sensitive conditions how well are we controlling blood pressure and the, the threshold here is 140 over 90. things like Previously, which we'll get into uh, a little bit later, um, the hemoglobin A1C composite measure, which was previously just asking the question of, did this patient get an A1C in this calendar year, which does not provide a significant amount of information other than a payer had to reimburse a test and it to some degree correlates with the, the level of care being provided because you asked the question. However, it didn't tell you anything about the level of control of their diabetes and to that end, They've broken this down into two proportions, and this is reported in two rates. The 0059 is of all of the patients who had A1Cs, what was the percentage who were greater than nine? And then similarly for control, who was less than eight? A another clinical question of, in of, of interest, HIV viral load suppression. Did you get the test? Yes. Was the number on the test fewer than 200 copies? Was the patient undetectable? That is a, a more useful way of measuring the quality of the care that's delivered for patients with HIV outside of the other social determinants of health, which we can't capture. And then similarly for behavioral health, which we will talk about, 
the asterisk here is that the National Quality Forum, who was the um, organization tasked by CMS to uh, implement a lot of these measures, was does not recommend this measure anymore in terms of medical assistance and smoking tobacco use cessation because it's essentially a documentation. It's based on a survey and, and not necessarily tied with um, the good interventions or the process measures um, that would act, truly reflect the quality of the care that the patient received. And the, the ubiquitous uh, HCAP survey. And so uh, across the 90 different measures that they look at and that they have decided these represent a core set. Um, cardiology as a discipline of internal medicine is among the most highly measured, followed by primary care, and you can see oncology and OBGYN follow the rest. But over half of these selected measures look at processes of care, about a third look at clinical outcomes, and, and then a, a small handful or a composite or patient reported outcomes like the surveys from, from patients. So I'm going to be reviewing um, objective number three, quality measures. And the main question that we are going to try to answer in this section is, are the measures currently measuring what we want them to measure? So there are three different types of quality measures. There's outcome measures, process measures, and balancing measures. Outcome measures reflect the impact of the healthcare service or intervention on the health status. Oh, sorry. There we go, I apologize. So there's three different types of quality measures, outcome measures, process measures, and balancing measures. Outcome measures reflect the impact of the healthcare service or intervention on the health status of patients. An example of an outcome measure is, um, does the percentage of patients who, the percentage of patients who died as a result of surgery or the surgical mortality rates? Process measures um, indicate whether a provider what a provider does to maintain or improve health, either for healthy people or those diagnosed with chronic health conditions. An example of a process measure is the percentage of people receiving preventative services, such as mammograms or immunizations. Balancing measures. Balancing measures are measures that a health system must track to ensure an improvement in one area of a system doesn't negatively affect another area. An example of a balancing measure is for example, if you're implementing um, a quality improvement project to reduce inpatient hypoglycemic events, you want to make sure that you measure the number of hyperglycemic events as well, because you want to make sure that whatever intervention you choose to reduce the number of hypoglycemic events doesn't lead to increased number of hyperglycemic events. So quality measures, there's good quality measures and there's poor quality measures. The easiest way to determine if a quality measure is a good quality measure is to confirm that it has been endorsed by the National Quality Forum, which checks each measure it endorses against a subset of properties. Some of these properties are highlighted here. So under good quality measures, a good quality measure has a good relationship to improved outcomes. The process measure is closely connected to the outcome. The measure accurately assesses the process and there is no or minimal unintended adverse effects or perverse incentives with high performance in the actual quality measure. Poor quality measures. So poor quality measures are those that do not improve overall patient outcomes and have unwanted or adverse effects. So the American College of Cardiology American Heart Association published this table in AHA journals in 2020 defining the components of a good quality measure. Why is, you might ask yourself, why, is, why was this the focus of American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association? Well, because as we saw in the previous slides, like Luke was alluding to earlier, the cardiology specialty is one of the most highly scrutinized specialties when it comes to quality measures. According to the table, a good quality measure is one that is clearly defined and meaningful, one that is reliable across multiple organizations, one that is valid and that it assesses what is it in what is intended to, and one that is feasible and that it can be obtained with reasonable effort. The Dartmouth Atlas of Healthcare uses Medicare Medicaid data or CMS to provide composite information regarding hospitals in the country. In the images illustrated, you can see that there are different that there are variations across care in the United States. 
In the map, green coincides with a higher rate and blue with a lower rate. There are two different measures highlighted here. On the left, you can see the percentage of diabetic Medicare patients receiving an eye exam. On the right, you can see the percentage of diabetic Medicare patients receiving A1C testing. Not only is there significant variation, but one can ask the question of, are these two measures really telling us what we want to know? Do eye exams tell us about the quality of diabetes care? Yes, we need them, but they don't necessarily tell us if the diabetic patients have retinopathy or not. Does A1C testing tell us anything about the quality of diabetic care? Well, it doesn't really tell us how many patients had an A1C greater than 9%. Interestingly, the National Committee for Quality Assurance required the A1C indicator as they deemed it does not assess, assess the test result or the quality of care. So what does this all mean? What does this all tell us? It tells us that when we look at quality measures, we need to think about the components of what makes a good measure and think about if the measure we are measuring is telling us what we truly want to know. So these two measures that we highlighted, the eye exam and the A1C testing are necessary, but they are not sufficient. They don't tell us much about patient outcomes. So let's take a look at a non-healthcare example. The example highlighted here is about World War II plane survivorship bias. So during World War II, military leaders had a challenge. They wanted to add armor to American planes to minimize the chances of getting shot down by enemy fighters. The challenge was that the armor is heavy. Too much of it makes the planes go slower and use more fuel. Too little of it doesn't protect them. So to optimize its placement, the military looked at data of bullet holes on returning planes. Some deduced that they should concentrate the armor on the red DOS because that's where the planes were getting hit the most. But Abram Wald, a mathematician from the statistical research group, looked at the problem a little bit differently. He reasoned that the armor should be placed on sections where the plane had no bullets or no bullet holes, the engines. That's because those missing holes were on planes that didn't return. And those should be the ones analyzed since they were shot down over enemy territory. This concept is called survivorship bias and is illustrated in the book called How Not to Be Wrong by Jordan Elenberg in 2014. Survivorship bias occurs when a set of data considers only existing or surviving observations and fails to consider observations that no longer exist. So what are the take home points from this example? Well, one, learning from failures or the missing planes is more valuable than learning from successes or the returning planes. And two, it is more important that we focus, it is important that we not focus or have tunnel vision to arrive at solutions, because if we fail to see the bigger picture, we may not improve overall outcome, which is what we're trying to get to. So how can this be applied to healthcare? If we purely focus on performing well on a metric or measure, we may fail to see that it does not lead to improved patient outcomes. So the Joint Commission currently has three tobacco treatment measures. This is another example that we're gonna be looking at. Those three measures include tobacco use screening, tobacco use treatment, tobacco use treatment at discharge. Now note that treatment refers to counseling and use of FDA approved cessation medications. To check the box of tobacco counseling completed, the nurse or provider must fulfill the three requirements highlighted below and provide clinical documentation. These requirements include a one-on-one -on -one interaction with the patient, providing of reviewing a pamphlet of basic tobacco use information and cessation treatment, and providing coping skills to the patient. So one might ask, if we look at tub one here, if we look at the tobacco use screening measure, is this a good measure? Well, checking a box a patient was screened for tobacco use doesn't necessarily lead to improved patient care outcomes. At the end of the day, it doesn't tell us how many patients actually quit smoking. Looking here to see, to check the box, was tobacco counseling completed? Well, if we check this box and we provide clinical documentation, we fulfill the measure, but is this a good measure? Is it actually telling us what we want to know? Well, there is lack of reliability as this measure is not reproducible in organizations and varies across workers. 
There is also a lack of content validity as it is unclear if the most meaningful aspects were captured during the counseling session. So again, these measures may be necessary, but are not sufficient. Let's take a look at another example, heart failure discharge instructions. So this article was published in 2013 in the Journal of American College of Cardiology. It highlights the six components required by the Joint Commission to be included in discharge instructions for patients with heart failure. These components include diet, exercise, weight monitoring, worsening symptoms, medications, and follow-up appointments. You might say, well, if this is a measure, there must be data or research to back this up and show it leads to improved heart failure patient outcomes. Well, interestingly enough, the paper shows that only independent that the only independent predictor of readmission was whether or not patients knew all of their discharge medications. Even though these guidelines were developed by experts, no one tested whether patients' understanding of these instructions affected 30-day readmission rate. So, although you could achieve high performance in this measure by checking the box and giving your heart failure patients these discharge instructions, you didn't specifically know that it improved readmission rates, the ultimate outcome you were trying to get to. Let's take a look at this other example, medication reconciliation. So in 2005, the Joint Commission added medication reconciliation to the National Patient Safety Goals. The National Patient Safety Goals were reviewed earlier by Dr. O'Neill. It is how the Joint Commission judges the quality of care for the organization that it accredits. The elements to fulfill this medication reconciliation measure are highlighted below. If you have all these elements, you're considered to have good performance on this measure. So the first element is obtaining medication information on admission. The second, comparing medication information patient has provided with inpatient medications ordered. The third, providing the patient with written information of medications on discharge. And the fourth, instructing the patient to review the discharge medication list with their PCP. So let's say I have a patient with heart failure and they present to the hospital with pneumonia and I discontinue their ACE inhibitor with no clear reason. Am I dinged for this based on these four different components? Well, not really. Wrong, a wrong medication can be ordered or the, the incorrect medication can be discontinued. And that doesn't say that doesn't necessarily ding me in any of these four components. So I can still perform good on the medication reconciliation measure. However, that's not really leading me to ultimate improvement in patient outcomes. Again, the point of these measures are necessary, but they're not fully sufficient in assessing patient outcomes. Another clinical question of interest, particularly with, with hospital medicine is DVTs and PEs or venous thromboembolism. And so what are the different ways in which that is measured and, and do those measures or the ways in which facilities are graded on this topic actually tell us about the quality of the care that the patients receive to try and prevent them from developing blood clots? VT is a big problem. Um, most of the data comes from the, the early 2000s in terms of the magnitude of the problem being on the order of 900,000 different patients developing these. Um, and at that time, one of the major issues was decreased uh, appropriate pharmacologic prophylaxis rates, but of patients who developed the outcome of interest, did you have a clot or not? About half of them are associated with either a hospitalization or surgery within the preceding 90 days from the diagnosis of that event. Um, back in 2005 uh, and 2006, the VTE 1 and 2 measures were developed um, to, to try and improve the rates of prophylaxis. And those were sort of consensus guidelines about um, what everyone could agree to measuring. The goal, obviously, of why would we, why should we be measuring this is to reduce the incidence and therefore the preventable harm that comes from venous thromboembolic events. Um, but the question of whether or not the measures that we currently have in place serve us well to the end of improving the systems and deliveries of care um, that um, Peter Pronovos and his colleagues will argue not uh, no, because what goes into when a patient comes to the hospital to delivering excellent care. Um, and so they outline the, the process measures. That if you were to truly be able to, to deliver defect free care, that, that would require assessing each individual part of the process, a, a documented evidence base or, or standardized risk assessment me uh, mechanism, then the coupling that with appropriate 
prescription of pharmacologic VT, uh, VTE prophylaxis if there are no absolute or, or strong relative contraindications that were documented. And then the patient has to accept that plan, and then the nurses have to administer the medication. Um, and then ultimately, the out, this, these process measures need to be tied to the outcome measure. Did those patients who received defect-free care have lower rates of the event or not? To be able to give us clinically useful knowledge as opposed to just collecting data on the, the rates of prescriptions. So here's a, a table that goes through. The Australians um, have a measure which at least uh, is the only one that ties a standardized risk assessment model to the prescription of, of the appropriate medication. Like this patient has a Padua or a Caprini or an improved score of greater than uh, medium. They are, they are at high risk, and then correspondingly, were they prescribed appropriate medication or not? Um, the VTE 1 and 2 just look at was per the, the prescription made, not whether or not it was actually given. And so the National Quality Forum has, has come closer to the answer with VTE 6, looking at was it prescribed, was it given, and then did the patients develop this, um, this outcome or not? Did they get a clot? after you gave them the medication. However, this, this measure fails because to truly tell us about the quality of the care that the patients received, because you could pass this measure for a patient who's been admitted to the hospital for two weeks, if on day 12 of their hospitalization, they receive a single dose of 5,000 units of heparin in the morning, and then later that afternoon, get a CTA that shows that they have a PE, that because they were administered one dose of medication prior to the diagnostic imaging study of the outcome that you would pass, that that would not be assessed as being potentially preventable. When in reality, we would need to have a continuous um, measurement of defect-free care or, or perfect performance on the process measures to be able to truly assess whether or not the outcome of interest was, was preventable. And also to, to highlight the different areas in which breakdowns in the process contribute more or less to developing the outcome of interest. And so how about, okay, we, we're gonna measure these things. Hospitals that, that have otherwise very high uh, quality indicators, which we want, you know, a composite score of how good is this facility, have generally very high rates of, of prophylaxis uh, prescription, but they actually ended up having worse rates of, of the outcome. Uh, of, of actual clots being diagnosed. So, so how could that be? If they're succeeding at the process, how could they get worse at the outcome if, if the measure is correct? And so the reason would be because they're looking. And so the surveillance bias of these facilities are perhaps more careful or more diligent or uh, hunting, hunting down these maybe some asymptomatic clots and they are looking with imaging studies and finding them and then they would be unduly punished for, um, for having worse scores on the VTE outcome measures when they are in fact delivering better care to their patients. To come back to the heart failure readmissions, which is opening up an entire can of worms that we could dedicate a single hour to. This uh, table comes from a study of one of our uh, DEN leaders, Dr. Motsi and his colleagues at Brook Army um, in 2010, looking at um, about 350 or so heart failure admissions at a tertiary hospital in Louisiana. And they, they asked the question, well, why do patients um, get readmitted for heart failure? What corresponds if we do a multiple logistic regression analysis? What, what stands out? Why are these patients coming back? Um, and you can see we have the only significant results are either the, pr the presence of ischemic heart disease, not a huge um, magnitude of effect, They're, the patient's hemoglobin, also not huge. And the biggest predictor would be illicit drug use. And then the second biggest predictor was high quality performance score. So what, is, what does that mean? They broke down basically half and half of the group into, did the patient have a perfect score across the Joint Commission at the times um, measures for um, discharge instructions? And you'll notice doc documentation, documentation, documentation. So did they get a long list of, uh, of discharge instructions that were specific and print it out and give it to them? Did you assess their LV function or did you plan to do that? Did the pay, was there documentation of an ACE or an ARB for those with EFs below 40? Did you document their smoking history and do the appropriate counseling and all those things? And for patients who scored perfectly, had 
defect free care here are very high scores on these measures. Do, if for doing better on the process, they did worse on the outcome of, of readmissions. And so then you have to beg the question, well, either doing these things does not truly improve the, the delivery of care or the give better care for patients with heart failure, or the outcome is not tied to delivering better care for patients with heart failure. And we can certainly argue about clicking a clicking a box and giving a pamphlet. Does that truly reflect giving good care? But more importantly, heart failure readmissions are, are more closely tied to other things than the quality of the care provided within the four walls of a hospital. Um, and we can see here in this in this paper, which was published in the last couple of months um, in Jack Heart Failure, I believe, uh, looking at almost 10 years of heart failure readmission data. What stands out? Why do these patients come back? And you can see very and in, in addition to the initiation of programs which provide financial penalties to facilities for having heart failure readmissions and assessing the, inf the impact of those uh, programs on did this change heart failure readmissions or not and uh, you can see the nice separation between the top blue lines and certainly the, the bottom yellow lines and then the two two lines in the middle these are quartiles of income for the patients so higher rates of readmission for poorer folks lower rates of readmission for better off folks um, for for all cause and then for heart failure specific even better separation among the different quartiles of income and so because heart failure readmission is not is blind to the death outcome that a readmission metric is truly more a, a metric of utilization and should not necessarily be considered a, a measure of, of quality of the care that the facility provided but it is a thing that we can measure because payers have that information it's in the historical record of uh, measures that we we are are left with but asking the question does this tr tell us about the quality of the care that the patients delivered, uh, highly, very doubtful. Another, another example, uh, which is going to open up a can of worms. Surely, surely, mortality, the hardest of out of outcome measures, um, and of clear significant uh, clinical uh, significance and importance to both patients and, and physicians. Surely, this must be the gold standard of being able to adjudicate quality differences between hospitals, right? Um, either your, more patient of your patients died or, or they did not. And the ways in which this is measured is through risk stratification, because to, to have just the crude number of deaths of all the numbers of patients who did not survive with or either during their stay or within 30 days doesn't really adjust for how sick the patients were. So, OK, then then they would go, well, let's do standardized mortality rates by by their age, like an actuary would or the Medicare death tables. Um, to give a better idea, and that that gets closer to the answer, but uh, then they they apply these hierarchical uh, logistical regression models to try and account for the differences in the severity and complexity of the um, underlying comorbidities of the illness of the patient, and then they have a variety of different numbers of variables that go into these. Um, many of them you will recognize from the charts if you have read them recently because protein calorie malnutrition is among the highest odds ratio as, uh, tying or, or in second place with metastatic malignancies generally in most of these equations. And you can see that the ones which have payment implications, acute MI, um, heart failure, um, pneumonia, um, many two of those going back to 2007. And so, OK, but how well did different facilities perform on these different measures? Um, you can see these groupings are fairly tight. It's usually plus or minus 2% around the average. Um, these are not to, to Dr. Wenberg's analysis in the Dartmouth Atlas are not undue variations in, in the um, delivery of care across the nation that among, you know, a majority of the hospital, you know, 4,000, 4,500 of the 6,000 or so hospitals in the United States what is the difference in the level of performance a little bit more for, for heart failure? But do these things truly enable us to make comparisons between healthcare systems or, or facilities about the quality of the care that they provide? So the signal to noise ratio of, of these of this particular measure. What is the amount of signal that we are looking for, meaning the variability and mortality that could be attributed to the differences in the quality of the care that they provide versus the noise of the difference in the mortality of the patients due to everything else? 
And so are we able to truly approximate or um, evaluate what the expected number of patients would be dying? That is the dip because the, the numerator and the denominator for this matter a great deal. And so how do we capture the severity of illness? It's based on the documented comorbidities, which are DRG based, not necessarily or do not account for the the, the acuity of the patient when they hit the door. How'd they look in the ER? What were their vital signs? Uh, what was their triage level by the ESI? Um, what was their shock index? What was their age shock index? In the, the era of COVID, what was their hypoxia age shock index? Um, these, none of the variables that go into the calculation of the risk stratification, how many do we expect? None of them account for social determinants of health, which as we've seen with heart failure readmissions, plays a prominent role. Um, and the fact that these come from a, a basis of an actuarial and payer orientation. You know, we, we know from the Federal Reserve that having dual mandates is difficult. You need full employment and you want low interest rates and inflation. And so if you are tasked with controlling the cost of an enormous government program, while also trying to improve the quality of care that um, patients receive, that you can typically do one or the other uh, well, but the other uh, the the second part does does not benefit as much. It also doesn't account for the variability in patient wish wishes, uh, and I'll I'll talk about DNR as one example. So what if the patient has a DNR? Um, the status their code the patient's code status on admission it signifies many different things. Um, it can stand for the fact that they have a more advanced age that they have a significant burden of other comorbidities. They may have a life limiting diagnosis. They may simply have had very high quality advanced care planning discussions. Um, and when you look at the, the mortality rates and if you slice and dice them by who had uh, DNR status on admission, that it's pretty variable across those different risk stratified mortality rates of interest. Could be between five and up, up as high as 25% across those diagnoses. And, when you see folks cohorts with higher rates of DNR when they enter the hospital, that they end up having slightly increased mortality and more significantly decreased readmission rates. And so because that's a, an event that occurs outside, does not originate from within the care provided at, during that hospitalization, you could argue, well, this really leads to sort of unfairly be, um, penalizing facilities for having higher mortality if you don't take it into the risk stratification and then unduly rewarding those um, for, for having decreased readmissions. And so uh, in this analysis, they, they did that and they found for every 1% increase in DNR rates, you had a, an odds ratio of about 1.06 for avoiding a financial penalty for readmissions. That odds ratio is the same in those risk stratifications as age as a continuous variable over 65 years old. And so you should say, well, certainly then we should add DNR status to this risk stratification. No, um, you know, the implications of doing that because they do not exclusively correlate with illness severity, which would be captured by the DRG. If that were the case, perhaps that would be appropriate. But if, if it means that the patient has spent 30, 60, 90 minutes discussing um, what their wishes at the end of life are, that we would not want to remove that reward of doing that. And so to that, and it would be, you know, that is delivering good patient-centered care that you wouldn't want to, un, the untoward or, or unanticipated consequence of adding that would be you would disincentivize facilities, not only from having patients with DNR on admission, but also from the process measure of performing high quality and, and lengthy advanced care um, planning discussions. And so the better way of doing this would be to truly um, uh, incentivize the process measure of, did you deliver excellent advanced care planning regardless of the outcome of that discussion? And so, you know, in the same way that we look at tobacco screening where you can check a box for advanced care planning, there are codes that go by 15, 30, 45 minute increments. And so that you would then be able to stratify how much time did you actually spend with the patient in the discussion? And that may be more reflective of and a better representation of that the quality of the care that the patient received. And so all of this is to say that it's more important to, to keep in mind that scoring well on a measure or a metric does not equate to delivering good care for the patient and sort of to, to always center ourselves on, does this help my patient and work towards constructing and building 
comprehensive ways of evaluation that include not only measures of the process, but tie them to the outcomes of interest. Great, so I'm going to be reviewing objective number four, quality improvement, and the purpose of this section of the PowerPoint is to understand different quality improvement methodologies and understand the approach to quality improvement. So there are different quality improvement methodologies listed here, Lean, Six Sigma, 5S, PDSA, DMAIC, and RIE, or Rapid Improvement Event. Lean Six Sigma is often used together. Lean refers to minimizing waste, so removing non-value, unnecessary um, tasks from the actual process that you're trying to improve. Six Sigma refers to reducing variation. So making the process more consistent and reliable across different workers and organizations. 5S, um, 5S, the 5S stand for sorting, setting in order, shine, standardizing, and sustaining. And what you're aiming to do by using the 5S QI methodology for quality improvement projects is creating a more organized and productive workspace. PDSA stands for Plan, Do, Study, Act. And this is basically a vir virtuous cycle of interactive changes. In every quality improvement project, you're going to implement one or two or multiple solutions. And every time you implement a solution, you do a PDSA cycle. So one quality improvement project can have multiple PDSA cycles. DMAIC, so DMAIC stands for define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. So in DMAIC, using the Lean Six Sigma methodology, you can focus on improving a system-based process. Using DMAIC usually takes um, six or 12 months to complete a quality improvement project using this methodology. RIE, or Rapid Improvement Event, is where a small team devotes about 100% of their time over three to five days to analyzing and improving an organizational process. So let's talk a little bit about the approach to quality improvement. Um, and we wanna give you guys an example from um, an article that was published. So in 2019, this article was published in PubMed, and it describes the importance of clinician-directed performance improvement in moving beyond the externally mandated metrics. A community hospital in Santa Fe, New Mexico, developed a clinician-directed performance improvement program designed to give clinicians the opportunity to conduct UI projects. The image shows an example of four different QI projects. And notice that each QI project had process and outcome measures. One was not independent of the other. Let's take a closer look at one of the QI projects they aimed, um, one of the QI projects they did, and it was aimed at reducing the number of total um, percentage of broad spectrum antibiotic days. See the time order data below from 2014 to 2018. And again, the goal was to achieve a lower percentage. After the clinician directed performance improvement program, you can see that there was a shift in the mean and the statistical process control chart. The goal of this QI project was achieved by allowing clinicians and the first line staff decide what they wanted to improve and what they wanted to measure. Looking at this other graph, you can see a composite of the efforts of the clinician directed performance improvement program. When the program was implemented, you can see that this led to reduce patient harm and improve patient outcomes. Since its implementation in 2015, the clinic, clinician directed performance improvement program has been associated with large improvements in quality and large physician engagement. So how do we know what we want to improve? This is where the importance of patient safety event reporting comes into play. We can only know what the organization needs to improve by looking at patient safety events and reports and how they have reported in the JPSR, which is the Joint Patient Safety Reporting System. Here you can see the efforts that the VA and USF have made to increase patient safety event reporting. In the VA, quality was implemented around July 2021, and this shortly led to an increase in incident reporting. Quality aims to review patient safety events and propose feasible system-based solutions. At TGH, GME Patient Safety Console was implemented around November 2021. This also led to an increase in patient safety event reporting. This other chart shows a closer view of what occurred after these implementations. 
So let's say we've evaluated a patient safety incident report and we have identified a potential issue or problem we want to improve. How do we even begin and how do we complete a QI or quality improvement project? Well, we can go through these steps and these steps are often used in the DMAIC quality improvement model. Remember the DMAIC is define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. So the first step in going about doing a quality improvement project is asking yourself, what problems and issues do you see in your day to day in your day to day work and what can you actually improve? The second step is analyzing whether your observation is a real problem. So this often requires you to collect baseline data and using your DAS or data acquisition and analytics team here at the facility to really see um, data for that problem that you have in mind. Then you assemble a team. So in assembling a team, you should aim to have subject matter experts and stakeholders. These stakeholders should, stakeholders should be directly involved in the process that you are trying to change. Fourth step is creating a project charter. So in your charter is where you, where you outline your aim, what you wanna accomplish with the project, your measures, your outcome, your process, your balance measures, and your timeline. When do you want everything in your project to be done by? Number five, you create a current state process map and identify current system issues. If you want to really improve a process or a system, you need to understand the intricacies and the steps involved in that process. Then you create a root cause analysis and you prioritize contributing causes. How do you know what you're gonna focus on? What should you focus on first? Then you brainstorm your solutions and you construct a future state process map. You then do small tests of change or small implementations or implementations of solutions, which again requires multiple PDSA cycles. And then you evaluate whether the intervention that you have proposed has led to any change or improvement. So one of the way the CRQSs have tried to improve quality of care for our patients here at the James A. Haley VA is with the monthly um, medical team influenza vaccination challenge. We, the CRQSs, motivate and reward medical teams in an effort to increase influenza vaccination rates. We compile composite monthly data to show medical teams their progress. Notice that in this data, we take into account the percentage of eligible discharge patients that are vaccinated. We wouldn't want to solely measure the percentage of discharged patients vaccinated because some patients may have been vaccinated before admission. So I give credit where it's not deserved. In this case, the measure, the percentage of the percent of eligible discharge patients vaccinated is closely related to the outcome. A lower percentage of eligible discharge patients vaccinated can lead to worse patient outcomes. We focused on the different identifying the different QI methodologies and our approach to quality improvement. Let this span on what we can do to prevent bad outcomes from occurring in the first place. And this is using an HFMEA. HFMEA stands for Healthcare Failure Mode and Effect Analysis. It proactively evaluates a healthcare process in the hopes of identifying potential failures and their causes before a process is implemented. The severity, probability, and hazard ratio are then determined. The HFMEA decision tree is then used to determine if the failure mode warrants further action. The decision tree helps determine if you should proceed to the next step in the HFMEA or stop. If you proceed, the next step after the decision tree is determining what actions you want to take for that specific failure you've identified. Do you want to eliminate or prevent all occurrences by removing the failure point altogether? Do you want to control or minimize all occurrences by implementing mitigating factors? Or do you want to accept acknowledge and accepting the known risk of the failure. The next step includes selecting an action you want to take, an outcome measure that shows effectiveness of that action. An example of an HFMEA we participated in um, during our year as CRQSs is a new bed tower simulation experience. By proactively assessing for potential failures in high risk situations like code blues during the sim scenarios, we had the chance to not only identify errors or failures that can occur, but actively participate in them before the new bed tower opens and before patients are actually moved there. So in this last slide, we wanted to highlight 
what the James A. Haley VA is currently doing and how we strive to be an HRO for a high reliability organization. An HRO is made of three, three pillars, five principles, and seven values. By striving to improve the quality of care for our patients, this is how the James A. Haley VA is working to become and to expand as an HRO. Just to highlight a few of these points that we've kind of focused on during our talk, culture of safety. So this focuses on if you see something, say something, right? Increasing patient safety event reporting. Continuous process improvement. So performing quality improvement projects. Always strive to improve the process. It can always be improved. And the last one I wanted to kind of point out that we've really focused on during our presentation is it's all about the veteran, right? Ultimately, with everything that we do, we always strive to do the best for our patient, and that at the VA is our veteran. So just to recap, these are the objectives we went over today. Quality in healthcare, organizations that judge quality, quality measures, and quality improvement. Let's just kind of close it out with some take home points. So the first point, quality and safety issues exist and persist. Quality must be measured. And Dr. O'Neill talked to us about the Joint Commission, the Hospital Compare, and the LeapFrog, the different organizations that actually judge quality. Not everything that is measured leads to safe, higher quality patient care. And improvement comes from focus on quality at all levels of the organization. And I think that sums this up. These are just our references. Thank you guys all so much for listening. Please let us know if you guys if you guys have any questions. All right, thank you. We have about one minute or two minutes. So fire away if you have questions. Now's the time. Apologies for going over. It's probably from me talking too much. Dr. Melzer's too kind in the chat. <laughs> all right, I think everybody, everybody's good. So they're happy with all your great work. We look forward to seeing you on the faculty on the new academic year. Remember, you're still chief residents till then. Ah. <laughs> Have a good day, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks again for an awesome presentation. Take care. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you. having us.